This week we have an internal speaker, in fact very local to this room. Joanna Marecki Milanchik is going to tell us about some work she's been doing with the, the North Campus branch of CRLT about screencast te technology. And I won't spend any more time introducing her since most of you know. <laughs> Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so can everyone hear me okay? Or do I need to project more? Okay. Um, so some of you have heard this many times, like Jamie, how, five times he's heard this talk already. So if you've heard it already, it's better every time. yeah, well, that's nice of you to say. Um, so some of this might be a repeat for you guys. Uh, but on the other hand, I also recognize that this is a different audience that I normally talk to. You guys care about the data. And so I'm a little terrified because <laughs> I haven't talked about this aspect of it in, in a lot of detail. So we'll see how this goes. I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, also, I'm, I'm really hoping that you guys will stop me and ask me lots of questions. And if I say anything that makes no sense or you want to know more, please just stop me and let's let this be a conversation. Now, I really can't go any further because I turned off the screen. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Yeah, but what did I do? There it is. Um, I really can't go any further without acknowledging my collaborators. And uh, Tershia is from CRLT. Is she here? She's supposed to be here. She's, I mean, without her, this wouldn't be possible. And also Katie Green uh, was really crucial because she is the statistician. And she's the one that allowed me, a lowly engineering professor, to actually go through the data and figure out what it means. I mean, without someone like this, I can't stress enough how important it is to work with someone who understands statistics in a really detailed way. So what I'm going to be talking about is this idea where we uh, created some screencasts to use in our classes and we wanted to see whether or not these screencasts actually improve stu student learning. And we wanted to find out whether the students were using them, if they liked them, how it impacted their grades, why weren't they using them, and so forth. Um, so I'm going to be describing all of those things to you today. Now, I'm pretty sure that all of you know what a screencast is, right? Do you know? Raise your hand. You don't know. Not everyone knows. Okay. So basically, a screencast is a movie that captures uh, whatever activity is going on on a computer screen along with narration. So have you heard of Khan Academy? That's a screencast, okay? But, you know, we were doing it first. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a lot of different ways in which you can do this. Initially, these screencasts were used as training uh, for software on the internet and so forth. But in uh, teaching, uh, in, in learning environments, you can use it in a number of ways. You can use it to actually capture a lecture. You know, so if I'm giving a lecture, we're, we're kind of doing it now. So I am being recorded and it's going to be put on the web. So that's what I would call a lecture capture, where it's just caught word for word and then you can get access to it later. But you can also have supplemental lectures more along the lines of Khan Academy. The way that we did this, uh, well, I'll describe that in a, minute, in a minute. And then there's also homework and exam solutions that you can do via screencast. So I just wanted to... Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, I just wanted to show you an example of what this actually looks like. So this is lecture capture. What happened between those two? Because actually breaking. So that's me talking. So uh, this is a lecture that was taken uh, that I gave in Chrysler here on North Campus. You can see me here. There I am. Um, and then you can also, on this screen, you can see the slides that are being projected on the screen. Now, the aspect ratio of this screen, the re resolution isn't high enough, but when you turn it, take it out of the projector, um, you can actually see that we've got thumb, uh, thumbnails of the upcoming slides, so you can actually scroll through. You also have this bar where you can go through the lecture if you want to. Okay, so this is lecture capture. This is available in a lot of classrooms on North Campus. So you engineers who want to do this, adopt this, I encourage you to try it. It's quite straightforward. Okay, so getting back. I'm not going to be talking about those, though. I'm going to be talking about using screencasts as an additional resource. So um, 
I already mentioned the Khan Academy. This is, you know, a really straightforward thing. The way that we did it is that um, one of the challenges of teaching an introductory material science course is you have so many different students in the class. You know, they're coming from all across the, the college, and they're sophomores, and they're seniors, and everything in between. And sometimes you the concepts aren't getting across the way you'd like. So I started using a technique called the muddiest point technique where I would pass out um, index cards, I mean index cards, right? And uh, ask the students to write down what they didn't understand in today's lecture. And then I would try to take that data and I would try to address directly what those misconceptions or misunderstandings were. The problem was that only about 30% of the class would misunderstand something. So I was kind of left in a bind. I'm like, do I address that 30% and disenfranchise 70% of the class? I mean, how do I actually handle this? And so what we decided to do instead is to create a screencast and put it up on C-Tools so that the students could access it if they want. Okay, so these are short videos about between five and ten minutes on topics that students identified themselves that they didn't understand and they wanted to learn more. Okay, so let me just show you an example of that. Um, the example, you know, and, and as I said, these are all on C tools for the students to access. So here we have um, a screencast on dislocations. I will turn off the sound now. You can hear me talking. Um, but basically, dislocations are a kind of a hard concept for non-material scientists to understand. So this is just, this one happens to be five minutes and I have, you know, I can index them so that students can go back and forth uh, and, and find what they want and then they can also use the, the scrub bar to kind of decide what they want to what they want to know and you know it's I'm talking them through it it's as if they're sitting right next to me and I'm explaining to them what a dislocation is so the second type of um, the second type of screencast that we used was a homework and exam solutions screencast and in this case what this is is a screencast that goes over the homework. So this is just a screen capture of such a thing. And what we would do is we would place the problem here. I have the problem worked out. The, oh, yes, please. But in, the, in the supplemental, do you find that you're repeating what you said in the lecture but now in a screencast, or is this actually deeper or different information than it's in the lecture? Well, I try to give them different information because you know they can always go back to the lecture a capture to, to hear what I said the first time. So the trick is to try to say it in a different way. You know, so if I used, you know, examples from the book, you know, you saw I used Wikipedia. It just so happens that the Wikipedia page on, on dislocations was pretty good. You know, so I threw it up there and I also had some movies that I didn't show during class that I could put in there as well. So, you know, the, you don't want to repeat yourself. They didn't understand it the first time you said it. Why would you repeat yourself? So the, the trick is to try to find a different angle and find different kinds of resources. Thanks. Yeah, otherwise it doesn't really work. Or you can work at uh, an example problem, for instance, that illustrates the concept. Um, we do that too. Okay, so back to the homework solution screencast. So in this case, what we do is we just work through the homework. And I'll show you an example of that as well. Um, here we are. This is a homework solution screencast. And again, what you see is here's the problem. Here's a graph. Here's me working through it. So here's me talking through the problem. And what I can do again in this case is I can work through the problem. I can work through the problem. I can go to uh, a Mathematica worksheet. I can go to an Excel spreadsheet. I can go back to the notes presented in class or whatever in order to show them how to do the homework. This is better, I would say, than even the most exquisitely annotated PDF solutions because, again, I'm talking through it. 
and I can bring in these different media elements to it, okay? In this case, the screencasts tend to be longer because we have several parts to them, but again, uh, what's crucial here, I think, is indexing, you know, so that you can go to the different problems and so that the students can actually go through it. Turns out, it's not as important as I initially thought it might be, but I'll get to that in a minute. Yes, sir? As far as the software and the other tools, like or some type of a writing thing, I don't know. What have you tried? What do you, is it easy to figure out what, what works? Is everybody using the same thing for it? Okay, yeah, so that, I could give a whole talk on that. <laughs> um, but just to, be, just to be brief on that, I use Camtasia, uh, but lots of people use Jing, and there are others. To be perfectly honest, I love Camtasia. It does what I need. I've never bothered to look at anything else once I settled on that. Um, and since I started doing this, there have been many innovations in screencasting, and I do not pretend to know what the latest, greatest thing is. I use Camtasia. I like it. Um, and then, you know, you can talk about the degree of, like I call it, YouTube versus Hollywood style production. Um, you know, you have to think about what you need to do. And I'd be happy to talk about, you know, what comprises a good screencast. Um, but I wanted to, why don't I get through some of this data stuff first, because we're about data, right? And then I can talk about what makes a good screencast at the end or even privately. Okay? Okay. Um, right, so these are the kinds of things that we are trying, that we're using in the classroom. And when I first started doing it, you know, I just throw them up on C tools and it's like I never heard about it again. You know, I had no idea if the students liked it, if they didn't like it, if they thought it was good, if it was helping, if it was hurting. And then I had Tershia come in and do a mid uh, term evaluation and she came back to me and she said oh my god the students love this and you know I was about to stop doing it because you know I had I had gotten no feedback and quite frankly this takes time yes. and we don't have enough of that so once I heard that this the students really liked it I felt re-energized and I started doing it again and more and in more detail and then we're just like oh but why do they like it and how do they use it? And we got really excited and we went off on this project to try to understand. So in this study, what we want to do is we wanted to document how the students used it, how often they used it, when they used it uh, for this introductory material science class um, that was taught over three years, February 08, 09, and 10. So it's been a couple of years now. Yeah. And John, I've got to ask, how, how do you measure love? What, what was the measure here? <laughs> um, no. Uh, well, it was feedback. It was, so in the... Student so in the midterm feedback, the students said, we really like this. We want more. So that was the initial love. Okay, and I'll, I'll get to my methodology. You know, that's not actually really great kind of data gathering, as we all know, because we are learning analytics people. But that was my initial piece of data that kind of gave me the courage and the enthusiasm to go on. Because if they didn't like it, what's the point, right? Yes, ma'am. Really quick, are those percentages referring to proportions of like the females who all, all the females who took the course, all the males, or are they just, you know, simple, like, um, are they referring Were there 75% more females in the class? Or yeah. So, um, this is, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking me. 23% of the class was female. 75% of the class was male. Um, no, this is, so what we're looking at here, this is the breakdown, the demographic breakdown of the classes, and then I'm going to map usage on that in a little bit. So this is just the breakdown, okay? And, and I, I wasn't able to get to that yet, but I saw another hand somewhere. Where was it? Okay. Um, so we wanted to understand, you know, how these students used it. So this is just, uh, we agglomerated uh, a number of semesters of data. And in all the semesters that we looked at, this breakdown of students was pretty similar. So we have about 23% women in the class, largely Caucasian. Um, we had a fairly reasonable split fairly even split between sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Freshmen generally don't take this class. And then we also had a wide range of majors. I'm sorry if this is hard to see, but basically the biggest groups of students that take this class are arrows 
aerospace, uh, you don't know what arrows are. <laughs> aerospace engineers, chemical engineers, and industrial and operations engineers. And we have a smattering of other kinds of majors that are in there, nuclear engineers, material scientists, of course, um, and other engineering. But, but those three majors comprise the largest group. Okay, so remember this, chemical engineers, aerospace engineers, and industrial engineers. So we wanted to understand precisely what you pointed out here. We wanted to know what was going on. So here are our research questions, okay? Do the students perceive them to be valuable? And we thought that was the impo an important first question to ask because if they, don't if they don't have that perception, they're not going to use them, study's done. Okay, so that was, the first, that was the first question we asked. And then what we, wanted to, what we wanted to do next is, does it help, basically? Okay, so they think they're helpful. Are they helpful? You know, and so we wanted to, like, look at this idea of self-efficacy and how does that increase our performance. And then we also wanted to ask this other question. What motivates the students to use or not to use the screencast? What are the factors that they take into account in their busy lives to, to decide whether or not they're going to use these resources or not? So this is what we wanted to know. Um, I did want to tell you that when we started the study I didn't know what a theoretical framework was. Okay, so those of you who do education research, I had no idea. So initially when we designed this, we didn't actually design anything. You know, it was kind of like, hey, let's see if this works. I mean, because that's just the way, you know, we were, we were doing it on the fly. So if I were to do it again, I'd do it much more smart. But um, it is what it is. But the things that we wanted, that we found that these things can address is this idea of self-efficacy. And so self-efficacy is just, you know, the student's belief that they can do something. You know, if a student has high self-efficacy, they will look at a topic and they'll be like, oh, yeah, I can, I can get my arms around that. I believe that I can achieve. If they have low self-efficacy, they'll say, oh, my God, I will never, ever ever be able to understand, you know, computer programming, never, you know, and if they believe that, then they won't. And so that goes to um, motivation. So intrinsic motivation, which is, you know, inherent I interest in a topic, and then there's also extrinsic motivation, which is, you know, you have to do it because you need it for, um, it's a requirement or Usually it's a requirement of some type, you know, so you have to do it, so you have to do well. Now there's another related idea that goes with this, and that's expectancy value theory. And basically what this is, it's, it's very closely related, um, but it, it has to do with choice. And, a, you know, a person looks at a resource, determines whether or not it has value, and if that, what I mean by value, whether or not it's going to help them. Okay, and so based upon that perceived value, what they expect from this piece of, uh, of resource, they will or will not do it. Okay, and so if you can actually take certain activities and place them somewhere, you know, within reach of their expectancy, then you can begin to shift, you know, extrinsic motivation. Oh my God, I will never learn computer programming show them some topics that are within reach, and then find, you know, move that motivation over to intrinsic motivation. That's what we all want to do as instructors, right? We want our students to come to the classroom because they want to learn, they want to be there, and they want to do the things that, you know, they, they want to become competent and proficient in the things that you're talking about. But we know that as instructors that some fraction of the classroom is, is just there because they have to be. So let me talk a little bit about the methodology. Perry asked the question, you know, how did you measure love? Um, so we did a number of things, you know. So with regard to student perceptions, what the students thought, of course, we asked them. And we asked them in various ways. So we had midterm evaluations that were conducted by CRLT. And then we also had an end of term survey that was also administered by CRLT. These surveys were optional. And we didn't, look, uh, we didn't look at the end of term surveys until after all the grades were turned in. 
Um, and then we also looked at what really happened. So we, so we found out, we asked the students what they thought, but then we looked at what really happened. And this is where the learning analytics piece comes in. What we did is we started to do some really in-depth statistical analysis on various types of data. And we got that data from C-Tools. Thank you, Steve. And we also got uh, the, a lot of data from the registrar. So we were able to get you know, academic back background. I had the major and I had the year, but I didn't have other things like cumulative GPA. I didn't know about their incoming uh, ACT, SAT scores, and, and, and other kinds of numbers that we had. We were able to get that from the registrar. We were also able to get demographic information, uh, gender and race in this case, and then of course, the student performance, I had all that data. I had the grade book. I knew how they did on all the assignments. I knew how they did on the exams. And I even kept copies of the final exams so that I can look at individual problems. And so I'll be describing to you one thing that we did to actually correlate usage of a particular screencast to actual performance on a specific problem. And as I said, all participation was voluntary. If students wanted to opt out, they could. No one did. Um, and we also didn't look at any of this data until after grades were posted. All right, so the first thing, as I said, Students love it, you know? So here we have the percentage of respondents, and here's, you know, a large fraction didn't look at it at all. And we'll talk about, I mean, it, it's a large fraction, okay? But of those who liked it, you know, they said that it was either very helpful or extremely helpful. So 90% of the, of the people who looked at screencasts really liked them. Okay, so that's good. We're going to be looking at this group of people, uh, well, all of them that were looking at the screencasts, and then towards the end of the talk, I'll address this group of students, okay, and talk about why they may not want to use it. So here are just some quotes that gave me an indication that they loved it. I'll, I will just uh, read one of them here. I felt that they were extremely helpful and much more extensive study tools. Screencasts can be downloaded and played on iPods, making them very convenient. And I hope that more professors begin, begin using this technology. So that, you know, when I saw that kind of response, I was just like, oh, they like it. They really like it. Um, you know, and so, so the students really seem to appreciate the effort that was put in and recognize uh, that they can be used in a positive way to help their learning. But, you know, that's not really what we care about, right? I mean, they, they can tell us whatever they like, but does it really help? Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But we were also able to look at the usage patterns of students. And so what we could, you know, what we could determine is how the students use them, use the screencast. And we asked them, you know, how did you use them? Did you watch the entire thing from beginning to end? Did you just rewatch segments? You went to specific points, you watched, you uh, watched large chunks looking for different kinds of information, or you just browsed around. So those are the different things that they could do. And and the students for both kinds of um, screencasts, both homework and the mini lectures, would tend to watch them from beginning to end, which surprised me. Um, I would think that they would just kind of zone in on the parts that they needed, but that wasn't what they did. Um, the highest watchers, the people who watched the screencasts the most, were also more likely to watch the homework screencasts from beginning to end. And those who watched the entire homework screencast from beginning to end were also those students who were getting the lowest homework grades. Yes, sir? It, was that self-reported, like, like, uh, like this data? Yeah, this was self-reported. Unfortunately, when we were doing the study, we didn't have the ability to go in and actually see um, you know, once they opened the resource, we couldn't see how long they used the resource. Um, that's still the case, right? If we're doing C-Tools, I think the lecture capture now system, if you're using the actual lecture capture from Generate, they have more fine-tuned. Yeah, elements. yeah, right. But when this was being done, I mean, we didn't have that capability. I know I've been talking to Phil about getting some of that ca capability in there, but this is self-reported. Yeah. I think the best that you could do is triangulate the self-report with the C-Tools data to see that the student how many did they open it? How many did they open? 
So you could get some validity check that way instead, instead of them yeah. knowing that they're just giving a socially desirable response. Right, no, and we, we did look at that data. When, when I talk about usage, that is actual data, right. you know, and not self-reported data. But this is, in the strategy, we couldn't get at it any other way. So as I said again, you know, the, the ones who watched from beginning, the, the homework screencast from beginning to end also were those students who were getting the lowest uh, grades on the homework. So this is positive to me. That means that, you know, students who aren't doing well go to the screencast to try to figure out where they went wrong. And uh, in fact, I have this quote from a student who responded, you know, why were you using it in this way? I got things wrong and wanted to fix them. You know, so that's good. And interestingly enough, there, this was the only case in which there was a gender difference. Uh, women tended to use the homework screencast less than men. And that's also correlated to the fact that women did better on their homework <laughs> than men. Um, now, it's unclear why that is. Um, there tended to be more women in the chemical engineering major, and they tended to do better in the class as well. So I don't know what's going on there, but it was an interesting observation. Yes, sir? Stop me if you're going to get to this, but is there a trajectory? Um, if they have poor performance and they watch the videos, does their performance on future homework improve? We actually haven't looked at that aspect. That would be an interesting thing to look at. We were looking at it in the aggregate. So this is the part that Stephanie was pointing out, you know, so we can actually look at, you know, so this data, number of students in final letter grade, I had that data, you know, so I could do that myself and I could just, you know, I could cut it, slice it and dice it any number of ways. I just so happen to have it according to major here. But, you know, the number of students and then the level of screencast use, I mean, that's actual data. And in the paper, you know, so we have, you know, very high, high, medium, low, very low, none. Um, this data in the papers, we actually quantify what those are. It's just that it's easier graphically to do it this way. Okay, and so basically what we saw, and it's hard to kind of glean out of this. You have to look at the charts and the significances. That's a word. Um, and uh, to look at that more closely. But there is a positive correlation between usage of the screencast and grade. What that means is if a student uses the screencast a lot, the student is more likely to get a good grade in the class, okay? And that was like, oh, very exciting. So the first, when we found this out, I ran into my class and I was just like, oh my God, if you use these screencasts, you will get a better grade. So the next, the next cohort knew. And that is an interesting little tidbit because that'll come up later. I hate to be the wet blanket, but could it not be that the best students simply use the... Yeah. Turns out that it's not. So we actually looked for that. We were just like, okay. You know, we, we put the Perry hat on and we're just like, okay, it's the best students. You know, we're going to look by grade. You know, so we actually looked at various factors. We looked at incoming GPA, incoming SAT score, ACT score. We looked at gender, race. We looked at every single indicator that we could come up with. Citizenship, we were thinking, oh, maybe non-native speakers, and we used a, a citizenship as a proxy for that because we didn't actually know, but okay. Maybe non-native speakers use them more because they can't understand when I talk this fast. But we got no significance against any of those factors. So it is not true that the good students do it. Okay, there is a group of students that do, and I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, well, uh, just clarification, when you talk about grades here, does it mean the final exam grade or the post-semester grades? It's the, it's the cumulative grade for the semester. Uh, final, final, final grade. Okay. You raise a good point, and we didn't actually parse the data that finely. However, to address that specific point, um, in my classes, I don't actually put a lot of weight on the homework because people will be making mistakes. 
you know, so it's only 10% of the grade. So that hopefully will minimize that effect. So um, that's, a, that's an excellent concern, and we haven't looked at it, but I think in this case we're okay. Yes, sir? Um, <clears throat> the homework on the screencast, was it the exact same example that had to be turned in, or was it a, an analogous example and they had to like, just follow the concepts and apply it to a new set of data? Or on the homework or on the, the exams? On the screencast. Like, was it like what you did on the screencast, the exact same thing they had yeah. to turn in? So the homework solution was the solution to the homework that they turned in. So it's supposed that you would use it afterwards. When That's you right. Grade. It was after. You wouldn't after use it as a study okay. aid no. before. No, you wouldn't use it as a study aid before. You can use it as a study aid for exams. Sure. And in fact, that's the most common way that students use them. There was a question here, and then I'll go there. I'm just curious, did you look at um, whether or not these are the same students that show up for office hours or not ever? The so the question was whether or not this was correlated at all to office hours. And um, I actually found that my office hours attendance way, went way down. I, I don't have any data on that. That's just anecdotal in my case. But, you know, the students were able to find the resources that they need. And so I didn't get, you know, because the most common reason why students come to, come to office hours is I didn't get this on the homework. Can you please explain? And so... I don't know if that's a good finding or a bad finding, and you still want students to come to office hours, um, but that's what I found in this case. Over here? It's just pure instructional logistics. Lectures are evergreen. You may improve them over time, <laughs> but you record once and use a lot with homework. Right? Do you worry about the solutions being out in the wild? Does that make it harder to use the same homework from semester to semester? Actually, you caught me with my uh, deep, dark little secrets. <laughs> One of the reasons I went to homework solution screencasts is because I didn't want my exquisitely annotated PDFs to be printed out and stuffed in a file somewhere. So this, how do you stuff that in a file? I suppose you, you could take screenshots, but that seems like a lot more work than people, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm underestimating students, but I was trying to, I actually threw up a barrier. That was a barrier that I wanted to try to prevent that. Um, you mentioned using the note cards to kind of figure out what to focus on. Is that still, like, after you did this a few times and you got through... You know, oh, God, no. the note cards <laughs> sort of condensed to a single, a single set of things? No, no, no. The, no. the note cards were an utter disaster. Okay. You know, because I passed out the note cards... And, you know, I would get, you know, so what is the one thing you didn't understand in lecture today? Uh, the meaning of life, you know. <laughs> or else I would get a comment, hey, professor, love your shoes, you know, really? So, um, I, uh, I stopped that. Okay, so, so, so my question is... Uh, so what did I do instead? Do they are, thank you. <laughs> do you think that there's... It's a regional focus to try and figure out and collect in a meaningful way what to make these screencasts about. And does that actually change for your class? Or do you kind of figure out the supplementary material and then it's there and then you don't have to? Okay, so, so what happened after the, the note card fiasco um, is that I actually went on and I used a C-Tools tool, which I forget what it's called because there's several of them now. What are, what are the quizzing things? They do what? Test Center. The test Center. I don't remember if I used Test Center or a different one. But I think it was Test Center, actually. And so what I did is, rather than, than making it open, what don't you understand, um, I actually gave them prompts. And I said, OK, so I covered these things in, in lecture today. Did you understand this? How about dislocations? How about slip? How about you know these other things? And so to get them to be more directed. You know, and this also had a benefit, I think, you know, of, so I actually have this theory about teaching that if you are clear in your expectations or if you do anything really, it doesn't matter what you do, screencasts, clickers, you know, note cards, whatever you do, your, your, your teaching will improve the students will respond more because you're doing something. So I, I really think that, you know, in, ident in saying, you know, how about, did you get this? Did you not get this? That kind of thing. I think that really helped in the teaching overall. And it also showed them what the expectations were. So kind of like, it's tough to tease out what causes what. I mean, that, but that's why we're here, right? To try to 
figure out what we, what we do and don't know. Where was I? Okay, so um, it wasn't the smart kids. Um, <laughs> it wasn't the smart kids. What it turned out is when we looked at it across major, major was the biggest indicator, okay? Nothing else was significant. Chemical engineers used the screencasts the least. They didn't use them, but they got the, big, the highest grades uniformly, and that is historically true. Industrial engineers use the screencast the most, absolutely, positively, the most. Prior to this study, the IOEs, and I'm not disparaging the IOEs at all, <laughs> but <laughs> they, on, as a group, got the lowest average score in the class. Before the intervention. Before the intervention. And this was, this is, you know, if you ask anyone in my department who's ever taught the class, they're like, yep, that's what happens. <laughs> After the intervention, I always, as a group, did average. Woohoo! Hallelujah, right? That is huge! Why? Why did it happen? Not because the IOEs aren't as smart as everybody else, they are. They had the same GPAs, they had the same ACT scores, all of the other academic indicators were the same. The distribution of men and women was about the same. There's absolutely no reason on paper that these students shouldn't be performing just as well, except for one tiny little thing, their curriculum. So we went back, you know, I was thinking about this, I was just for giggles, I decided to look at it. So this is our curriculum, these are the topics that are covered in, in this class, and I, I realize it's small. Uh, so physics of materials, thermodynamics, kinetic transport, structure, mechanical behavior, those are the topics that, that we, in general, cover in this class. If you look at the chemical engineers, thermodynamics, you know, heat and mass transfer, separation processes, it's all really similar, right? It's not precisely the same, but these students know what diffusion is, so when I talk about diffusion, they know what that is. They know what a phase diagram is. So when I talk about it, it's fine. Now, aerospace engineers also had a lot of overlap, not nearly as much. They, they understand mechanical properties, as they should, because we don't want those airplanes falling out of the sky. <laughs> IOEs, look at this. This is, their, this is their curriculum. Economic decision making, operations modeling, probability and statistics, intro to optimization. Nothing is remotely close to the kinds of topics that are covered in this class. So it's not that the IOEs aren't as smart. They've never seen this before. And everyone else in the class has. So, yeah. Have the others really seen that though? Because isn't this like a sophomore junior class where they're just getting out of physics pretty much? And Remember, so. the distribution of, of, of academic year was fairly even between sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And in fact, the IOEs tended to be more on the seat. They, they tended to be seniors. So they've forgotten all the physics. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Maybe, but I mean, this is a technical, uh, this is one of the technical electives for the IOEs, and it's also, I think it's required for the aerospace engineers, I don't remember, and I think it's a technical elective for the, the chemies. Okay. Yeah, so um, I, I don't know that it's the major, I, I don't think it's the year necessarily. Um, I really do think it's the curriculum. They've never seen this before. There was a question somewhere else. I was just going to ask about the relationship between year and um, major. So, yeah, so it's not, there weren't statistical, I mean, the significant correlations there, but I always tended to be seniors. Um, chemis, I think, were pretty evenly distributed. Aerospace, also kind of evenly distributed. Um, yeah, so, so we found this to be really, really exciting because basically, what we found is that these screencasts can have an, a positive impact, you know, as a student resource. You know, and, it, and this is especially for students who have less familiarity. And this is so exciting for those of us who are teaching classes where there is a very large distribution of academic preparation and background. We don't have to throttle back the class. We can provide extra resources for those people who need it. And we've shown that it works. So that's very exciting. Um, 
So, and we also went, how much time do I have? What time is it? I have 10 minutes left? Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, so this is just a case study where what we did is we, wanted, we went back to the exams, to the final exam, and I specifically, I had a, a, a screencast that was on mechanical properties of polymers. Okay, so I had one there. And I specifically designed a final exam problem that was that tested those concepts. And we wanted to do like a, a, an analysis to figure out whether looking at that particular screencast impacted that particular answer. And so what we found, now we looked at IOEs in gen specifically. So we pulled the IOEs out because we knew now that the IOEs had the most to gain and they saw the greatest gains. And so we just looked at that group. And basically what we saw is that if an IOE you know, watched any screencasts, that they tended to do better on this one problem. But obviously, if an IOE student watched a particular, that particular screencast that correlated to that problem, they for sure did better. Um, this is also somewhat true for arrows. So this is, this is just some of the statistical stuff. I put, I put that up there for, um, for the data people. So you see that for the IOEs, uh, there was a strongly significant, we have two stars here, for both this, uh, the, the general and the particular. And for aerospace, there's also it's also significant, but a little bit less so. Did you say watch any screen test? Did you exclude the one that was particularly useful? No, just all of them. If they watched, you know, so if they watched screencasts, and but maybe not necessarily that one, they did better. If they watched the particular one specifically, then they did better. Okay. So that's interesting. Okay, so um, that's performance. Let's talk a little bit about motivation. So how did they use it? This is self-reported data again. Primarily they used it as an exam study tool. Okay, so what the students would do is as they're preparing for the exam, they would go through these screencasts, whether they were mini lectures or homework solution screencasts, they, they would use it to study. And I, and I do think that basically what happened there is, and, and maybe it's like a natural consequence, they tried to understand the concepts a little bit better and also they learned what the important concepts are for that particular class. Um, they knew what to focus on. So remember when I was all excited and I ran into the class, I'm just like, oh my God, it works. 58% of the students still didn't use them. Okay, so now we're just looking at the one semester that I had told and showed them that it actually works. Okay, and so we asked the questions why they didn't use them. If they didn't use them, why didn't they? So only 58% of the students actually use the, the, the screencast. Why don't all of them? If I tell you that something works, you know, eating chocolate makes you lose weight. You will do it, right? Um, but they didn't in this case. And so I apologize, this, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a variety of responses. So these were responses generated by us and then they chose them. Um, so by and large, the largest group of students who said that they, they didn't use them, they said because they didn't need them, okay? Some people forgot, some people didn't have time, some didn't find them helpful, they couldn't find it. They had technical issues or they used another resource. Okay, and so what we did then is we correlated that against the final grade to see how they did. And the mean grade in this case was uh, 85%. Okay, so those of you who didn't need the additional resources, we found a strong significance that, that it was true. They got higher grades. So they didn't need it. They recognized that, that, that they didn't need it. They correctly understood their learning and what was required. And so they didn't need to use the screencast. The next group that had significance was the forgetful group. They forgot. And there was a significant, statistical significant, that their grades were lower. And then similar, that did not have time. They weren't quite significant, they were close, but they also had a slightly lower uh, grade, average grade on the, uh, uh, in the final course. So I'm not sure what this means, you know. Is it that they forgot, I mean, is that a comment on their time management skills, you know, so may, and maybe that's why they didn't um, 
they didn't uh, uh, use them or they didn't do as well. Um, there was, right, okay, so, so really, you know, this, this group of students who forgot or who didn't have time, had they used the screencast, it's pretty clear that they would have done better in the class, yeah. Did they have to pick one, just one of those? No, they can answer multiply, and we took that into account when we were doing the statistical analysis. So there are ways to do this. This is why we needed Katie, <laughs> you know, to actually be able to do the, to, to run the correct correlations and obtain the right relationships. So we did take that into account. Oh, and it would be possible in the future then, if you found some students who really need this but aren't using it, that you could prod them along the way? That would be great. The student that forgot is not motivated for some reason. Right. Right, right, or they didn't have time or something. Well, I mean, you know, Tim is working on that kind of a system, right, for physics, where, you know, when we were doing this, we had no idea what we were going to find, right? I mean, it's not that it was a fishing expedition so much, but it kind of was, right? We weren't sure what we were going to see. But now that we know this, I mean, it seems like a really cool way, you know, if we could actually track what, what students are doing, then, then this would be great. Yeah? So I, I just want to point out there's sort of this, um, this assumption that we make about, about how these things might scale that we should question. So just be, and I think what you're doing is great, but, but. <laughs> you can identify a, a subpopulation of students who are really helped by watching the screencast. If we then say, everybody should use the screencast because it really helps you do better, I don't think we actually know that it helps all the whole population do better. Right? There's, there could be people who would do fine with that. And there could even be possible negative. It, it's just hard to know. I'm not saying it's a screencast in general, but right. maybe a general issue with learning analytics data. You know, is that we shouldn't assume that what's true for struggling students is true for all students. Or all students struggle in the same way. Well, but we actually we actually tested for that, and we did find that there was a significant positive correlation between general you know usage by anyone and their course grade. Um, but then when you dove into the subgroups, we found that there was a very strong, significant uh, correlation for the IOEs. So even the even the uh, chemies who used it, um, you know, so it did shift a little bit, you know. But a lot of them didn't use it because they didn't need it. Another thing I think would be interesting to look at goes back to the longitudinal question because I'm remembering data from a study that Brian Capola did some years ago in uh, chemistry, where he looked at he had data po performance data points. And at three of them, early in the class, mid in the class, and late in the class, and he had a high performers at each of those data points. And the thing that characterized the students who started out low and ended up high and made them different from the high high and the low low was that the students who improved uh, added additional study strategies. So the students who realized what they were doing wasn't working and actively sought out other resources and mechanisms for improving what they were doing. And the students who stayed low probably kept pounding their head against the same wall they'd been pounding their head against. So looking at some of your data longitudinally to see whether the students, when they realize they're doing poorly and then start using these uh, resources, whether those in particular are the students who right. improve from looking at them. Right, and we haven't looked at that. I mean, certainly the data's there um, we could probably look at it. Um, okay, so basically what we've learned is um, we've learned that screencasts can be useful for explaining concepts and procedures, how to do the homework. You know, and so what this does is it can shift the first exposure. So rather than, you know, the first time I tell you about dislocations being in lecture, you know, maybe I could have this, these screencasts and we, you can look at them before coming to class so that we can actually work with this concept once we get into class. So it also levels the, the playing field and allows people who haven't seen it to, to kind of catch up. It also appears that the screencasts enhance student self-efficacy, and I mean that in a very specific way, in a very educational, jargony way. Uh, and basically what it means is, you know, it, a student who is efficacious, yes, that's a word too, um, will want to use these things, will end up using these things more uh, in order to improve their own uh, mastery of the concept. So that's not for sure because we actually have to design the study in such a way that probes these various concepts and there are tools that do this. 
they call, they're called instruments in the field, <laughs> which was really fun for me to learn. And we didn't use, we didn't use those instruments, um, but it does, it, it is kind of suggestive. So we really need to do it properly, you know, do a proper research study. And then the last thing that, that, I, that we learned how to do is how to publish in the education literature, which as an engineer was like a completely new thing. Um, so that was fun. And we published this work in two papers. Two, um, these are two uh, peer-reviewed papers, Journal of Engineering Education, also Advances in Engineering Education. We also have a number of um, of uh, proceedings papers. So if you're interested, I can get you copies. Yeah? Uh, taking it back to uh, expectancy value theory, Yeah. you talked a bit about um, value Yeah. And how you measured that. Yeah. Um, oh, we didn't actually measure it. <laughs> well, you captured it in some way. Right. In terms of like the helpfulness scale, Yeah. I think that can be used as a proxy for, for value. Apparently we can't. OK. <laughs> that was, yeah. Um, that was one of the biggest things that I learned is, you know, when we use the word value, I, I don't know what, what um, discipline you're from. With, I'm okay, oh, okay, so um, when we were, maybe, when our paper was reviewed and we tried to use that as a proxy, we were pretty much spanked. Okay. Um, we were told that that was not an appropriate way to do it. Um, that we actually need to be using this, these specific instruments. So the words, I, I found it very interesting because the word value to me, you know, I, and the word value to you guys, I mean, it has a meaning, but in, in education, I guess it has, or in expectancy value theory, it has a very specific meaning. And, and I learned that we couldn't haphazardly use proxies. I don't know why they more like, how dare you not use my scale? Yeah. 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 Exactly. Maybe, I don't know. Well, but also you said the homeworks themselves were only 10% of the grade. That's right. So in terms of expectancy value, getting a really high grade on the homework isn't particularly motivating. If you're confident you can not do the homework and still score well on the exam. So. Yeah, and people do that. Yeah. Or people attempt to do that. Well, <laughs> did, how did you operationalize expectancy for success with baseline academic measures? Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me that again. Uh, so, all right. So if you have you have expectancy value, yeah. and you know whether whatever instrument you use to operationalize value, you also would want to operationalize expectancy for, for success. Yeah. Because like you're saying at the beginning, when you walk into the class, you might say, "There's no way that I could ever learn this," or yeah. "This is really easy to me." Right. Um, so being able to, to measure that. We, we didn't measure that directly, no. Um, I think, you know, what we were kind of using as a proxy is major, you know. Mm -hmm. So the chemis walk in and, you know, they've seen mass transport, they've seen phase diagrams, and so they have a high expectation. When they see the syllabus, they have a high expectation, I'm guessing, that they can do well. Um, because all, a lot of the material is familiar, whereas the IOEs, you know, this is like a completely different language to them. So I'm using, I'm using major as a proxy there. And like I said in the beginning, you know, when we started doing this, I mean, really, we were just, I was thrilled that they were using it and they liked it, okay? And then once we started digging into the data deeper, we started coming across all of these other concepts and self-efficacy and value and expectancy. and now I would design a completely different, I would do it completely differently. Um, but when we started, I mean, I'm an engineer. We just did it with duct tape and a little bit of spit, really. So um, I think that's it. Uh, yeah, I, I also have some uh, screencasting best practices if someone's interested. Yes, in the back. Uh, does screencasting replace any other uh, course materials like textbooks or anything like that? Not in my case. Um, I did not use them that way. I use them strictly as a resource. No, but I mean from the student's perspective. So, so for instance, I've done some things, but nothing is uh, expensive. But um, when I've gotten done, I just realized that I was helping people that were not reading the book. And you know, I could, I could have some question and and uh, it's written out in the book that here's, it's, it's an example problem in the book. And that there's this fraction of students that just simply aren't reading the book. And so when, when I set up this, uh, this venue where people could collaborate, 
there was this group of people that were doing the very, very helpful people, but they were basically just providing these algorithms for people to avoid reading the book. So well, I, I just thought I just thought that was a uh, replacement strategy. For it something. could be, but you know what? I don't really care what where they get their information as long as they understand the concepts, right? I mean, it shouldn't matter where they get it from. Um, I try not to replicate what's in the book because I figure that is a resource that they have. And certainly there are students who very kindly say, there is nothing that the professor added. I just read the book and I did fine. You know, that kind of thing. Um, and so that's certainly true. Frankly, you know, that's true for any class, right? If you read the book, you don't need to go to class necessarily, maybe. Who knows? I don't know. One can argue, make the point. So we didn't look at that. Um, but I have to tell you, I don't, I don't actually care, personally. Yeah? So right now we treat courses like franchises that are, that are run by the professor. Um, can you imagine, how far away do you think we are, can you imagine a future where um, your screencasts are just part of the library of curated screencasts in engineering, and uh, we assemble course materials from this library of screencasts as opposed to it being your screencast for your class? Yeah, I think that's a really great idea. Um, you know, people, so I have this, I, ha I have this opinion about screencasting and, and video online and everything. Some people are just like, ah, university's going to go away, you know, we're just going to have it kind of like, do you remember that, what was that movie? Rodney Dangerfield? Back to school. Back to school. Have you seen that? I'm not proud of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the scene is, the scene is that you know there's a professor teaching a class, and you know there's it's a montage, and at first one person puts out a tape recorder, and then more people put out tape recorders, and then eventually the entire class is tape recorders, and then the professor leaves, you know, a real to real tape that's, you know, speaking, <laughs> right? And so people are, are, are worried that this is going to happen with the, these new technologies. And I just don't buy it. I just really don't think that's well, true. I asked you about whether you were still producing screencasts. And I was also curious, because I have this curiosity of my, of my own, is whether the best students can actually produce some of these screencasts. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, 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 yeah. As a matter of fact, um, colleagues of mine are doing that. You know, and, and using that as a tool, you know, student-produced screencasts. Yeah, no, I think it's a brilliant way to do it. You know, and there are so many different ways. I mean, people, you know, back in the Middle Ages, you know, when the printing press came, they were just like, oh, my God, we can print our own books. We don't need readers anymore. Well, you know, the university setting is going to collapse. It didn't, you know. It just changed the way we, we, we um, present material and the way we interact with information. And I think we're at that point now where, you know, we're just changing the way we present information, and we're on the cusp of a revolution. So it's exciting. Well, I think we should thank you. Yes. <laughs>
record in short segments because you, you edit it it's you just it's like have you ever used like iMovie you just drop them into a timeline and it's straightforward there's some great Camtasia workshops and stuff on campus too yeah and can I tell you the Camtasia tutorials are really good they're screencasts so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, screencasts about screencasts. Um, and then, yeah, so watch the tutorials. You want to learn about cutting, zoom and pan chapters, and then making sure that, that the aspect ratio is good for the web. And then you just upload it. You can't, up, you can't use the native upload tool, at least you couldn't before. I don't know, maybe that's different now. Um, they're, t they're typically too big. I use Cyberduck to drop it in. So, and I could talk at length about this stuff, about the difference between YouTube and Hollywood production, using the, the inline microphone versus the $500 microphone. You know, it's, it's your call. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to point out that M plus Box is a great way to share screencasts through C tools because you can still have it within C tools, but it's drag and drop and you don't have to, everybody gets 50 gigs of space and that's a tool that I've used a lot. Okay, so, great, good. That's good to know. And, and, and yeah. yeah, I just started using that recently, but not for not for this.